scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. We started Thank discussing you. the subject of grace. Um, you may want to call this by grace through faith. Part two. This is our final session together. And um, I'll just do a quick recap on our last session for those of you who were not around um, please do well to get the teachings they are most edifying to just open you up to the foundation that we laid amen let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 we'll start with that scripture Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Bible says who hath blessed us now take note not who will bless us, who hath blessed us with all, not some, hath blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The Bible tells us that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And um, our last time together, I began to talk about uh, the fact that the grace of God first represents an awareness, a consciousness. A consciousness that it is a disposition of understanding. Please pay attention. A disposition of understanding that um, reveals the limitless provisions and the possibilities that are contained in God accessed through the office and the person of the Christ. So the limitless provisions, the limitless possibilities that are in God, resident in God and available to the saints through the mediator, the office and the person of Jesus Christ. This is the grace of God. That the grace of God is not merely a provision that helps people to come into the faith life, uh, what we call salvation. Um, it is not just anointing. Those, those are just dimensions of it. But that generically speaking and holistically speaking, the grace of God represents all of the multifaceted dimensions that are in God, the possibilities and the provisions that are in God, available to the saints through the person and the office of Jesus Christ. You have to get this. So it is first the consciousness. The grace of God represents the understanding, the orientation, the consciousness of this reality that I come to God and I am aware that God is limitless. There are infinite possibilities encapsulated in God, the Father, and they are all available to the saints but only through the person and the office of the Christ this is the first revelation of grace then the second definition of grace I said is the empowerment that come on that comes to the believer on account of that consciousness that when you believe in this kingdom it does not just stop as knowledge or information your belief attracts a dimension of empowerment that now energizes you to walk in keeping with the provisions that makes those realities manifest in your life. 
please don't miss this. These are not just mere play of words or with words. They, they are the foundation that will govern our understanding and even what we'll be dealing with today. So the consciousness of the limitless possibilities that are in God given to man through the person and the office, Christ, the grace of God, the empowerment that that consciousness attracts, that energizes the believer, supplies the supernatural strength and capacity in the believer to walk in keeping. You see, we need that supernatural strength because there are certain conditions that the Bible requires that the believer must be postured in or postured at for the release of the manifestation of that grace. And by the strength of the flesh, no one has that, that ability. So our belief attracts an energizing that helps us to walk in keeping with the principles that make for the manifestation of those realities we desire. I said a lot of things in our last session. I may not go through all of them, but I will just mention a few that are worthy of note. One of it is that um, understanding grace does not just stop in believing this reality. If we stop just in believing this reality as though our job is just to believe, um, that is not exactly very accurate as we'll be learning. There is a lot more to it. And this is what I want to discuss right now. So we discuss the subject of grace and then true faith. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and verse 9. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, then through faith. I, I did clarify yesterday the Bible's concept of works. What the Bible calls the works of the law is not action, no. The Bible does not forbid action. In fact, the Bible is a book of actions. God is a God of actions. Every time you see God, he's always acting. Even Jesus in his position of rest is still making intercession for the saints. So I, I want to clarify this because the idea that the moment we believe, there is nothing else to do. Us is just to believe and God does everything. Um, it is a very sincere communication, but I may respectfully observe that I do not believe based on the integrity of scripture and the lives of those with proven results, that there is always an action or a set of actions that are taken not as additions to what God has done, but as participatory responsibilities to make manifest that which has been finished in Christ. I think we need to understand this. We established the last time that realities have been finished in Christ. He dwells in a realm called now. His realm is not just light. His realm is now. There is no tomorrow. There is no yesterday. He does not dwell in time. His realm is now. So all realities are present and true in his realm. But from this dimension of the kingdom, there must be a system of spiritual transportation. Having believed that those realities are true, having believed that there are no limits to this God that we serve, we must now sustain the spiritual intelligence to transport the realities that we desire from this realm and this dimension to be made manifest in our realm. And the name given to that entire process is what the Bible calls faith. Bible faith. I want to talk on faith. The provision allocated to the saints to help them transport this grace the riches of God's grace to make them manifest. It is by grace, but it is through faith. So faith becomes the channel for grace to flow. Anything grace cannot provide, faith cannot manifest. Understand this. Faith does not just manifest arbitrarily, no. Faith hinges on the fact that that provision is already a reality in the realm of the spirit. That that provision is already finished in Christ. And the assignment of faith is to be the bridge between the realm where it is finished and the realm where it is required to be made manifest. So that spiritual realities can be transported from the realm of the spirit, healings, deliverances, miracles, breakthroughs, all 
all of the dimensions that help the saints to walk in victory that have been purchased through the finished work of Christ, they will not manifest just by merely agreeing and having the consciousness that it is true they are there. The Bible is very clear, for instance, uh, in the fact that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible is very clear as to God's desire to see the saints walking in victory, uh, health-wise, in victory, in finances, victory in their lives, and all sorts of things. But we do not see that as the reality of many in the kingdom. Even those who love Jesus, those who have surrendered their hearts to him, those who have received of his life. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18, Paul began to lament mentoring the church in Ephesus and he said, being alienated, he said uh, that having the understanding darkened. He's explaining why believers cannot, have not come into the fullness of the potentials of that which the life of God provides. The finished work of Christ has given us access to the full scope of God's grace. The Bible calls it all grace. But that just knowing it does not guarantee that it will be made manifest in my life and your life. And he's saying the bridge here is that our understanding is darkened and that we're being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in us. Our hearts being blinded. So this is very powerful. The grace of God. I did say the last time we met again that the highest revelation of the grace of God is the finished work of Christ. What we call the finished work of Christ. The concept of being finished is realities that have been fully purchased from God's standpoint. Please understand God's idea of finished. He speaks from his realm. So when the Bible says everything is finished, when Jesus said it is finished, what he meant was that access, the potential to access all the multifaceted dimensions of the grace of God have been fully purchased. And through him, the Christ, Jesus, access has been given to man. But I made a statement that I would want to just make again. That the grace of God provides access to the provisions of God or provisions in God. Please listen. The grace of God provides access to the provisions in God, but does not automatically make them manifest in my life and your life. Please understand this. So whether or not my life captures the full essence of the power, the glory, the beauty of God's grace, if my life does not capture certain dimensions, it does not mean those dimensions are not in God. The grace of God is able to provide those dimensions, but that through my not understanding the ways of God, I have limited those dimensions from finding expression in my life. So the life and the testimony of the average believer is not necessarily a reflection of the limitation of God or the limitation of his grace. The grace of God is as unlimited as God is, but that we have not learned that it is by grace but then it is true faith. So if all you have is by grace, you are still limited. You will need to understand the channel that transports that grace from the realm of the spirit to be made manifest in your life. Praise the Lord. So let's discuss the subject of faith. Very, very powerful. I like to talk about faith because it is a very powerful topic. Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. Help us, Holy Spirit. Numbers 23 and verse 19. You are worthy, worthy of my praise. You're the King of kings, Lord of lords. Let your kingdom reign in my heart. Adonai. You're the Lamb of God. Truly you are worthy, worthy of my praise. Let your kingdom come. It's our prayer, O oh God. Let your kingdom come. Numbers 23 and verse 19. God is not a man very powerful scripture god became a man 
but he is not a man. God is not a man. If you say God is a man, that means he was created. God became a man. That means he made himself a man. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Saying and doing. Take note. Saying and doing. This is God now. Not just saying alone. So when God says, he does not stop at speaking. He does. He says it and he does it. And hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Very, very powerful. Next scripture. John chapter 11 and verse 40. John 11 and verse 40. Jesus said to her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. That if you believe, you will see the glory of God. So there is a relationship between the manifestation of the grace and the glory of God in your life and your believing. Let's discuss faith. What is faith? Number one, let me say what faith is not. For most people, when we say what is faith, they will say faith is believing God. Um, I don't totally agree. Faith is not just believing God. Believing is part of the process of faith. But faith is not limited to believing. Faith is not limited to believing. Believing is part of the process that is ultimately called faith. But faith is not just believing. What then is faith? Faith, this is my definition. Even though Hebrews 11 tells us very clearly that now faith is, verse 1, the substance of things hoped for. He calls it the evidence of things not seen. He says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3 says, through faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were made of things which do appear. This is my definition of faith. And if you're writing, you'd want to write this down. Faith is the name given to the action we take based on our conviction of who God is and the integrity of his word. Faith is the name given to the action that we take based on our conviction of who God is and the integrity of his person. This is what the Bible calls faith. The action you take based on two things, your conviction of who God is and the integrity of his person. Action, action. The action, actions of obedience based on conviction. Act, actions of obedience, not actions of desire, not actions of will, not actions of wish. You can take actions out of sympathy. That's not faith. You can take actions out of um, a desire to move. That's not faith. Your action must be based on obedience. That means your action must be the, the corresponding participatory requirement that is made, that is needed to actualize whatever promise it is that you want to see manifest. This is very powerful. Let me take it again. That faith is not mere belief. Conviction is powerful, but that's not all faith is. Speaking the word is powerful, but that's not all faith is. It is a sequence of spiritual equations that equal faith. And I want to discuss them very quickly. The foundation of true Bible faith, 
the foundation of true Bible faith is the word of God. Without the word of God in the equation, there is no basis for believing. It is not believing anything that produces result. It is believing what God said. Because the nature of faith is that it is the speaker that is responsible for manifesting what he said. So, if you believe the devil, the devil has a responsibility to make sure that what you have believed him for comes to pass. If you believe your brother or you believe your sister or you believe your government or you believe whoever, they have a responsibility to ensure that what you have believed provided the conditions that, are, that were stipulated for their manifestations have been kept, that the speaker or whoever it is whose word has been believed is responsible uh, for seeing that that result is produced. In this case, God. So the word of God is the foundation of, for true Bible faith. When you believe the word of God, then you allow the hand of God, the might of God to step in, to see to it that that which you have believed comes to pass. Please take note of this. This is very, very important. The foundation of Bible faith is the word of God. Without the word of God, there is no basis for believing. This is very powerful. Very, very powerful. Number two, conviction. What is conviction? Conviction is your depth of persuasion, your depth of persuasion, your depth of certainty. These are the equations of faith. The word of God, the basis for faith. Then your conviction. Conviction on what? Number one, the integrity of God. Please take note. Numbers chapter 23 tells us God is not a man. is a manifesto of his integrity. In fact, the Bible is full of um, a manifesto of the integrity of God. Things he said from Genesis to Revelation and things he did. He said it, he did it. He said it, he did it. Let's go to, I think, uh, Genesis 21. Genesis 21. Verse 1, Genesis 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. This is integrity now. Why did the Bible have to give us this information? Because the Bible already tells us, okay, at least we would have known eventually that, that he came. But God took out time to stress the fact that, hey, God said this and now he has done it. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. Not visited Sarah as it just happened. He said it and the Lord did. Notice every time his Bible faith, there is a saying and there is a doing. God is not a man that he should lie. If he says it, he does it. So when believe is trouble, because God says and he does, there is his speaking. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we can use that scripture to say when God is convic convinced and convicted about something, he takes action. So believers, we are convinced and convicted, then we take action. But if we stop just at the realm of conviction, it becomes mere belief. And it is not belief that produces result. It is belief plus actions of obedience. Are we blessed? So God visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. Very, very powerful. So we have here conviction. But I must tell you that when you are convicted, conviction is a measure of the depth of your persuasion. There are two dimensions of God he calls believers to be convicted in. Number one, his integrity. His integrity. God wants you to believe he is a God of integrity. Remember, we are discussing the system that helps us to access the grace of God and make it manifest too. We call it faith. So when I come to God 
my first assignment is to vet him and to probe him. God allows men to probe him. He dares us to probe him. That's why the Bible is not a hidden book. It's open from Genesis to Revelation. And he allows us to probe him through different dispensations and to conclude whether or not he is a God that is worth our trust. Integrity. And then number two, his ability. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. If your conviction is not based on God's integrity and his ability, you're not walking by faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must, number one, believe that he exists. Then number two, believe that he has that ability to be a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So you must believe that he is. Then you must believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That he has the power to make this happen. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Follow carefully, believers. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now watch this. Now unto him that is able, able, able. We are seeing ability here. Able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. This is the power of God now in motion. The power of God in motion. Ephesians chapter 1, please. Give us from verse 18. Ephesians 1 and verse 18. Paul is praying over the church in Ephesus. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? The Bible does not just say God has power. The exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Look at that description. The exceeding greatness, indescribable greatness of his power. So we are dealing here with a God who has integrity. Number two, we are dealing with a God here who has ability. There are many people who have integrity. They really do. They, they are people who will keep their words if they have the power to. But the unbecoming of them is that they don't have the power, the financial wherewithal, the political wherewithal, the intellectual wherewithal to fulfill that which is in keeping with their integrity. So it takes more than just having been a person of integrity. You must also have the power to maintain your integrity and God has both the ability I mean the integrity and the ability so if I am persuaded when I become persuaded I become persuaded that God has the integrity and he has the ability that means whatever I find in scripture remember yesterday we said that the scripture represents the boundaries of God's commitment to the believer that God is not committed to the believer outside of the provisions that are revealed in scripture so the word of God represents the boundary of God's commitment to us so I search the word of God like going through a garden and I find there exceeding great and precious promises the bible says exceeding great and precious promises this is what the bible says so i find there different dimensions of possibilities that the grace of god can provide and then my first assignment is to vet the integrity of this God. When I come to the conclusion that God is able, and then number two, he has the ability, I am now confident. Watch this. When you are convicted, the, the height of your conviction is the point where you now, listen carefully, you now understand what God is going to do as well as the role you have to play. Listen to me, please. Meditation and revelation brings us to a point where we must understand the role that we have. 
Every provision of scripture has conditions for the believers to satisfy. These conditions are not addition to the finished work of Christ. They are not additions. They are participatory roles. They are the roles that demonstrate that we believe God. Remember that every time you believe, there is a call to action. This is very important. Are we together now? So the Christianity that merely stops at confessing or just believing I'm convicted, I know God can do this, will end up disappointing the saints. There is always a participatory role. This is the responsibility dimension of the faith life. And this is a dimension of the faith life that many believers do not want to subscribe to. And I thank God for opportunities like this, this conference under the leadership of our, our dear father and pastor, Dr. Joda, to be able to bring these truths to believers. That it does not just stop at believing or even professing. We must go to the extent uh, of understanding the conditions allocated. There are always conditions. Always conditions. These conditions do not add to what Christ has done. These conditions are called actions of obedience. They are participatory actions that partner with the Holy Spirit in actualizing that which has been finished in Christ. For instance, for a believer to be saved, the Bible gives us the condition. Romans chapter 10, from verse 8 to 10, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, give it to us please, Romans chapter 10, from verse 8 to 10. It says, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. The word, that is the word of faith, which we preach. Verse 9. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe with thine heart, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hold on. Do you know believing that Jesus is a prophet does not save you? Do you know believing that Jesus is God does not save you? That's not the allocation for salvation. There is a specific detail about Jesus that the sinner must believe to be saved. Not every information about Jesus brings salvation from sin. He is many things. Believing that Jesus is Rapha does not bring salvation from sin. Believing that Jesus is God does not bring salvation from sin. Believing Jesus is a good God does not bring salvation from sin. It is believing the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus as a revelation of the Father's love through his death, his burial and resurrection. That is the condition allocated. That is the body of information that is responsible for salvation. So you can have a believer for many years or you can have a Christian or anybody born in a Christian family for a long time. He does not argue about the reality of Jesus. But he has not come to the point where these truths are his construction. That person according to scripture is not saved as far as receiving the life of God is concerned. Very powerful. Verse 10, same scripture, 10 verse 10 now, Romans. It says, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Right? So, back to our equation. I am convinced that God is true. I am convinced that he has the power. My next assignment now listen carefully. My next assignment now is to find out the promise that God has vowed to make happen in my life. What is the spiritual condition allocated? Until you find the role you have to play, the participatory role, not a role that adds to what Christ has done. It is finished. But the role that you have to play in partnership with the Holy Spirit to transport that reality from the realm where it is finished to the realm where it is needed, where it, is, it will be made manifest, you must know what that role is. For instance, the Bible lets us know that a lazy man who will not sow during the rainy season will beg in the time of harvest. And remember, the speaker of this truth 
is a person of integrity. Even though he used men to speak, the Bible says they spoke as they were inspired of the Spirit. So these are the words of God. That means there is nobody who becomes determined to be lazy who will succeed God's way. You see that? Because he's negating the condition allocated, diligence, among many other spiritual provisions is part of the equation that makes for a life that is blessed, a life of beauty and color. Very, very powerful. When people had delays or when people had losses in their lives, according to scripture, it took the ministry of the prophetic to bring them out of it. So every time people face unfavorable situations, whether it was the axe head, whether it was the debtors coming to carry the children of the, the wife of the late prophet, anything that had to do with restoration was allocated to the ministry of the prophetic. So if you search in scripture and the Bible says, I will restore to you. So I found out from scripture that the grace of God is able to bring restoration, but that the dynamic of that process is I must understand the principles allocated. So I now know through prayer and God leads me to a man of God, a servant of God that has the unction allocated for my restoration. And then I engage that principle with understanding. And then God is now committed. Please understand this. God's commitment starts when your obedience is done. God's commitment is not, is, it doesn't just come at random. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. God's commitment comes when your obedience is complete. Having the readiness to judge all disobedience when your, your own obedience is complete. There is he that scattereth and yet increaseth, the Bible says. There is he that withholdeth more than his meat and tends to poverty. So anybody who wants to increase God's way, there, is, there are the spiritual laws that govern wealth and abundance, for instance, and one of it is the law of giving. So you cannot withhold and want to increase God's way. You can increase any other way and with it will come a plethora of sorrows. But if you want to increase God's way, is a non-negotiable condition that there is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is he that withholdeth more than his meat and tends to poverty. This is very important. Now, believers, listen. Our assignment is to find out the truths that the word of God has made available to us in Christ and then find out the, the various conditions. Please, please, in the name of Jesus, understand what I'm teaching you. Find out the conditions allocated. Allocated manifestation of these truths. Then you can now obtain grace. Remember, grace as empowerment now. When you find those conditions, your next assignment is not to move in the flesh. Because some of those conditions are very difficult. In the flesh, you may not be able to walk in keeping with them. So you need to obtain an energizing from God that now empowers you to do. Not every dimension of God's grace does for you. There are certain dimensions of God's grace that empowers you. You do the doing. You, you will do the obeying. But it will not be by the strength of the flesh. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the vision to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.